Thank you. <laughs> well, well, thank you, <laughs> Paul. That was a wonderful introduction. I can only disappoint you now. Um, <laughs> <coughs> I got to start by saying that you know I, I I have no gifted insight. I have no presumption that the way I see the world is correct. It just happens to be the way I see the world, and the best that I can do is share that with you. And the background that I've had got me to the point that I am. And you know, we need to share with one another the way that we see it, and not have to have this need to compel other people to agree or disagree. It just it is what it is. Um, you know, chem chemicals in the environment are, are a scary thing, and we lack so much knowledge about the impact of chemicals in the environment. I want to I work with you for a second. Let's, let's just go through an imaginary exercise here. Imagine that I have a lemon in my hand. I'm holding a lemon. You can see the yellow lemon. I'm sticking my fingers into that lemon, and I'm tearing it apart. Now, the flesh of the lemon is... Oh, I got a little piece of pulp here. I can taste the sour, the tartness of that lemon. I, I can smell that lemon. Right now, you're listening to me talk about this lemon. There are things happening in your brain triggering, triggering physiological events. Your heart rate is a little bit different. Things happening in the saliva of your mouth are a little bit different. There are things being emitted into your stomach anticipating that lemon. You are a different person right now, and there is no lemon. <laughs> If we can change our physiology by thinking about a molecule and a material, can you imagine what a real one does? We, this is serious stuff. We need to understand what's going on. So the question becomes then, why, wh why do we have materials? Why do we invent things that hurt the environment, that aren't helping us but are in fact hurting us? Why do we have prizes then to come up with new ways to repair the damage that we've done. We've got to step back, we've got to think, why is it that people make technologies that are problematic? And I want to share with you a thought. So I am the luckiest person in the world. If you ever came to the Wanna Babcock Institute and Beyond Benign, it is the most coolest place in the world. You walk in and you think you're in an art museum. We feature artists every three months working on the intersection of art and science. We have a new artist being featured on Thursday um, next week. And I just want you to imagine for a minute, if we, if we look at a piece of art, and we're looking at that piece of art on the wall, or we're listening to some music, we can say to ourselves, in a very technical way, look at the use of brush stroke, you could look at the use of color, and very technically analyze that piece of art. We can listen to music very technically and say, well, listen to the tempo, listen to the way that the, those, those notes have been put together. But then we can stop and we can react emotionally. We can say, I like that. It's beautiful. There's a certain aesthetic to the appreciation of art in which half of our, ourselves are intellectual and analytical and half of ourselves are emotional and aesthetic. What have we done in science? But we've robbed the soul of that other half. To be a good science, you must deny the existence of the aesthetic. You do not say to science that I like it. In fact, we are trained as scientists to only speak in the third person. Five grams of such and such a material is taken with seven grams of such and such a material, and it's stirred in a pot, and this happens. I didn't take five grams. Five grams happened. <laughs> huh. <laughs> so, if that stuff is a carcinogen, I didn't make the carcinogen. <laughs> five grams of this and five grams of that. And, and so the problem becomes that we have this illusion that you must rob science of bias. Because of course, as a scientist, you must perfectly be you know, dispassionate, looking at what's going on and check little boxes and remove any bias. But wait a minute, are we removing the bias or are we creating a construct to pretend the bias isn't there? All right.
what would be the worst thing that could happen if I published a scientific paper and I said, fellow reader, I work for a company that will succeed financially if this works. Obviously, I am passionate about this working, but that therefore creates a blind sight in me so that while you read my work, please be aware that this is where I might be not thinking straight because I have a bias. Would the world suffer from that truth in science? Okay, so there's an interesting thing because the other problem is that while there's, there's two types of knowledge. There is the makers of information and then there's the makers of things. And if you think about that, there's a big difference there. When you make knowledge, you're disseminating information to other people and you're impacting people, but those people have free will in how they will behave with that knowledge. But when you make a thing, you have the responsibility to know what that thing is going to do. All right? And so, if you imagine this, and, and I spoke here a few years ago, and I think I startled people, and it's worth stating once again, I am a PhD chemist, I make molecules. I have never had a class in toxicology. I have never had a class in environmental mechanisms. If you Google every university in the United States and the world, and you look at the classes that students must take to get a degree in chemistry, you will not find one program requiring a student to take a class in toxicology or environmental mechanisms. Why do we have molecules that hurt us? Well, how could we not? So beyond benign, you know, Amy Cannon's organization has this program called the Green Chemistry Commitment. And they're asking chemistry department chairs to sign this commitment saying, well, we realize there's a catch-22 here. If none of our faculty have ever had training, who's going to teach this? And so if they say, well, we're going to take the resources over the next five years and try to figure out how to bring this into the curriculum, and if one university has a standalone class and another university integrates in a different way, well, we share that information and people can learn from each other on how to do it. Can you imagine a day in the future where no chemist graduates without that training? Can you imagine making things just go away? You know. People ask, people ask, John, what should we be working on? Should we be working on solvents? Should we be working on polymers? Should we be working on plasticizers? Should we be working on dyes? Go, work on the people who make those things, and we take care of them all. You know, it just seems so straightforward. Um, but, you know, oh well. Um, so, you know, in, in biology, we have you know, the, this concept of evolution. And, the, and sometimes, and I think in, in, in this group, I don't think this is a surprise, this flawed concept of um, survival of the fittest. You know, if you have this predator that argh, eats all of its prey, it ain't going to survive very long. That Lynn Margulis, you know, had it right in, in, in the symbiotic planet, that it's not the survival of the fittest, it's the, the survival of the most compatible that survives. But now, can you imagine that kind of thinking with making chemistry? To have products that don't survive because they're the fittest, but because they're the most compatible. That they have the least impact on anything that is unintended. There are less or no unintended consequences. But the mindset is such that that's a very aesthetic concept, isn't it? And if scientists don't have that aesthetic concept, what do we do? So the, 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 the logic here is to look at biomimicry from a different perspective and bring that into the beakers and flask people. And I'm going to give a little bit of a chemistry lesson, so you got to brace yourself here, OK? <laughs> so we hear about how humans, in the way we manufacture things, we heat things to high temperature, we put things under high pressure, we use all these harsh and nasty reagents. And then we look out in nature, and we find that nature completely does so much better than us in diversity and complexity, but also does it at room temperature, <laughs> at ambient pressure, using water as a solvent. Now, okay, so let's state that. 
and accept it. But why? Here's the big question. Why can that happen in nature? All right, now, I, again, here comes the chemistry, so, so brace yourself. In chemistry, what we learn are that molecules have very precise geometries. One molecule looks like this and has these electrons in certain geometries, and another molecule over here has a certain electronic geometry. And when molecules bang into each other, most of the time, nothing happens. They just bang into each other. But of the infinite ways that these molecules could bang into each other, very rarely a reaction occurs. And so when we in our factories have these pots and beakers and flasks where these molecules are banging into each other, we as humans, the only way we can make it happen with the word efficiency, whatever that means, is to increase the temperature, increase the pressure so that the velocity of those molecules go faster and faster and faster so that the frequency of those collisions happen faster and faster and faster, and we make more of the stuff that we want to make. And for 180 years of what we call modern chemistry, that is the mantra. Now, here is the epiphany. There is never a reactive collision in nature. Nowhere in a cell, nowhere in a living organism do two molecules bang into each other. What happens is they first snuggle up to each other using forces. And they assemble together, they line up, then they react. And that's biomimicry at the molecular level. And if we can understand that approach, and look, and, and I, I joke about this, and I call it molecular psychology, and I say, you know, <laughs> if I make a molecule, if I say, you know, I am so tough, I am so good, I am so smart, I am going to make this be a paint. <laughs> All right, well, okay, I make a great paint. But you know what? If I put a molecule on a couch and I say to it, what would you like to be? And the molecule looks up at me and says, I'd like to be a paint. That's going to be a heck of a paint, right? <laughs> and, it's, and it's that kind of thinking that we need to do to start looking at the world in a very b different way. All right? And so, for, ex for example, let's, 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 let's give a, a little bit of an example here. One, one example is, you know, one, one of the most frightening things is the technology that people use to change their color hair. All right, this, that's some pretty, pretty I'm not going to get into the philosophy of should we or should we not. People should have the right to do what it is that they want to do. But the chemistry that's involved is kind of scary. All right? Now, one day, I was contemplating the, the concept of what's called sclerotization. What sclerotization is, is when an insect gets big, its exoskeleton can't survive that growth. So what it does is it breaks off. So like a beetle will shed its skin, and then it's like all soft and white. And after the course of a couple hours, it turns hard and black again. And I looked at that, and I said, huh. Something that starts out soft and white, turns hard and black in nature. Hmm. And so what I did was I looked at the process and, 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 and mimicked that process, and I put it in the beaker, and I took some gray hair. And I put the gray hair in the beaker, and it went dark. Huh. And so then I looked at the hair, and one of the, the, the strands of hair was dark black. One was light brown. One was dark brown. I go, oh, this is not so good. Uh, but then I talked to the person who gave me the hair, and they said, oh, that wasn't one person's hair. That was a bunch. Oh, my goodness. So it turns out that this chemistry from the beetle that is edible, that is non-toxic, that is gentle, that is room temperature, restores the human pigment to the hair. It is not artificial. It is exactly that. And so as a submission to this, I am 100% gray hair. OK, so about four or five weeks ago, I stuck this in my hair just to show I've got, I've got a guinea pig if I'm going to do this. All right. So this, this is, if you could invent a time machine and go back 30 years, you can't tell the difference. This is not an artificial pigment. This is the human pigment that restores the color hair. OK, so that's an example. And you, you know what the big breakthrough is? Is that when people color their hair, they beat the heck out of their hair and put this artificial stuff in it. And ironically, 
the color that your hair is, is controlled by the way the proteins in your hair embrace that pigment. And so the someone who has black hair, the hair is snuggling onto the pigment to make it look black. If someone has brown hair, it's holding on to that pigment to make it look brown. And when we, in our typical way of blasting the heck out of the hair, we rob it of that in intrinsic capacity to tell us what it wants to be as opposed to what we want it to be. And so the only way that you can do this, therefore, is to approach it from a non-egotistical perspective and say, I'm not going to make my hair do this. I'm going to let my hair do this. <laughs> you know, and it just seems, it seems so straightforward. But how, as a chemist, do we do this when we're trained in a very, very different way? All right, and so, so, so how, how does this, let's, let's talk a, a little bit about some more examples. All right, so Alzheimer's is a very frightening disease, all right? And so we, we were thinking about Alzheimer's and looking at mechanisms of Alzheimer's. And you know what's really, really, the, the issue here is that there are proteins in your brain, and those proteins in your brain with certain metal ions, as we go, grow older, certain diseases happen to make these small particles make those, those proteins clump together. And it is that aggregate of proteins that causes Alzheimer's. And so we looked at that mechanism and we said, what if we took this natural material that interfered with that mechanism so that they didn't clump, or better yet, disaggregated? We've got an Alzheimer's drug that's entering clinical trials based on this mechanism. Right. Now, what's... what's now, now here's, here's the interesting thing. If you can see a protein moving around and another protein moving around and clumping together, ready for this? Brace yourself. That's how we synthesize semiconductors in solar energy devices. We take little tiny particles of, of semiconductors, we heat them to five, six hundred degrees, maybe a thousand degrees centigrade, slamming them into each other so that they coalesce and they make the semiconductor. Do you realize your most average of solar panels you have to use for seven to ten years before they make as much energy as went into making them? All right, but wait. What if we look at what happens with proteins and we do the same thing and we treat that in the same way, say, how can we convince these things to coalesce at room temperature? And you know what? We make solar panels at room temperature from water that are non-toxic, that third-year-old children are taking powdered sugar and blackberries in their school, making a coating, shining light, and generating electricity by stepping back and saying, gee whiz, maybe the molecules already know what they're doing. You know, the, the third example that I'll talk about is asphalt pavement. Well, it's something we really got to think a lot about. There's a lot of waste in energy and material and toxic materials under our feet, literally, all over. There's a, a billion miles of road in the United States. Uh, one billion miles. Now, we can't turn back the clock and make that stuff vanish. We can't, so what do we do? Do you realize that the sun and the air oxidize the pavement so that when we repave, most of that has to go in a landfill and just sit somewhere. All that waste, all that waste, we use high temperatures to take out new stuff. So wait a minute, what is asphalt? Asphalt is gravel with some sticky material around it holding it together. Well, so wasn't the semiconductor, so aren't the proteins in the hair. Learning from what's happening in nature with the proteins, seeing what's happening, we've come up with a material that allows us to take a, all of the old pavement, process it, and put it back on the road at 50 degrees less temperature than it started with no new materials. Again, learning from nature how to do that. And I think that that's... That's where we have to, we have to, we have to stop and, and think about it. Here goes another chemistry lesson, so here goes, uh, I'll stand on this side now. So, <laughs> in thermodynamics, there are two things. There is entropy and there is enthalpy, okay? Enthalpy is the strength by which things stick together. It's very ordered. Okay, and so we in science, we take the reductionist approach and it's very easy to understand enthalpy. Entropy is the randomness of things. And it's messy, and it's dirty, and it's 
confusing. And so we oftentimes don't focus on that because we can't master that. We can master the order, the reductionist approach to science. But when it comes to the randomness, we're a little bit fuzzy there. But guess what? Nature works with randomness. Nature's design recipes are all on that side of the equation. Something that we don't feel comfortable with, so we don't do it. We focus on delta H, not because it's better, but it's because what we can understand. And you know what? We need that randomness. We need to embrace that we don't know everything and accept that because of that lack of full knowledge, we don't know the, the downstream impacts of what we're doing and we should approach it with a bit more humility. But instead of being... <laughs> but instead of being afraid of that randomness, we've got to look at it, we've got to try to understand it, and we've got to accept that it's beautiful. Right? That there's certain beauty in that, that, that science in that randomness, there's a certain amount of beauty. Technology in randomness, there's a certain amount of beauty. And if we can put beauty into invention and science, there'd be a day where all we're doing is celebrating and not worrying. Thank you.